Funding for this program is made possible in part by an anonymous KPTS donor. The Law Offices of Morris Lang in Wichita supports KPTS. With attorneys practicing in over 35 areas of law, including bankruptcy, personal injury, and family law. On the web at morrislang.com. It's the interview you've been waiting for. Your dad was arrested right, there. right down here. Her father, one of America's most notorious murderers. Your dad actually took your neighbor's body after he murdered her. Terrorizing the Wichita community for decades, living a double life. So he's the kind of dad who built you a treehouse, right. uh, played with you in the treehouse, had a good time with you, yeah. but yet he was the serial killer. When he's finally identified and caught, the end of Wichita's nightmare is just the beginning of Carrie Rossum's. So did you say to your mom, this, this can't be dad? Tonight, she answers the questions you've been wondering about. Were you afraid? Yeah. It's a local exclusive. Susan Peters with the interview that Kansas television stations have been trying to get for years. How did you and your brother and your mother not have a clue that your father was BTK? No questions are off the table. Do you want to say anything to the victim's families? As BTK's daughter speaks out. When police identified and arrested Dennis Rader as the BTK serial killer, the Wichita community could finally breathe a sigh of relief. After three decades and ten murders, the cloud of terror and mystery was lifted and there was no longer any reason to fear BTK. Loved ones of the victims finally got some closure in whatever measure of justice is possible after such horrific killings. But for Dennis Rader's family, his arrest marked the beginning of a real-life nightmare that endures to this day. Here's Susan Peters with Carrie Rawson, who says she is forever branded with the shame of being BTK's daughter. It's been 14 years since your dad's arrest. Why did you decide to come out and talk about this now? Um, well, it took me a long time to just kind of get out of being in shock and shut down and dealing with grief and the loss of losing my father, because that's what it felt like the day he was arrested, that I had lost, I had lost this man out of my life, like he had died, but he wasn't dead. Dennis Rader's 10 victims were dead, though, and had been for years. The first murders, 1974. Four members of the Otero family, father, mother, and two children, ages 11 and 9, found tortured and murdered in their Wichita home. No one realized at the time that these unthinkable murders were just the beginning of a killing spree that would terrorize the Wichita community for decades and no one could have imagined the killer was Carrie Rawson's father, Dennis Rader. We're on the street, your street, mm -hmm. you grew up on, mm -hmm. and you'd walk to school this way. Right. What, what do you feel like when you're on this street? Um, well, now, I mean, it's the place where my dad was arrested and like, you know, my mom was removed from her house and then our house was torn down like two years later. So to me, it feels a lot like loss and grief here. To me, the house is gone. Anything that was worth anything to me is gone. So to me, it's just an empty lot. But it's also really hard because the house should be here. Like, if you could just remove everything my dad did, it would just be my dad and my mom still living here. You know, and it would be where you would still come for Christmas and your grandkids would get to play outside. But, like, I would do anything to take everything my dad did and just erase it you know, and have the 10 people back and have my family back. The date was February 25th, 2005. This is breaking news. A developing story from Park City and Wichita City Hall tonight. A Park City block remains closed off as Wichita police search a home. For the first time publicly, BTK may have a name and a face. Police say they caught Wichita's serial killer more than 30 years after his first murders. 
your dad was arrested right, there. right down here. Yeah, at the corner, he was coming home from lunch. He rounded that corner and they, several Wichita police and KBI and possibly FBI pinned him there with their trucks. And um, then they, he got out of his truck and they pinned him to the ground and arrested him. The day your dad was arrested. Yeah. To say you were shocked was an understatement, correct? Um, yes, I went into physical shock. It was a bombshell, Carrie says, blew up her life. And now this is the street I remember from 2005. Right. National media. Oh, yeah, that's what I heard. Up and down everywhere. I mean, the street. Yeah, like, like. Every national media was here in 2005. Right. What you think when you saw all that national media on your street? Insanity. Like, I mean, that was early on, so just a, we were still in shock and trying to cope, you know, day to day or even hour to hour. You had a normal family life with your father. Yeah, I understand everyone's looking at my dad in height, like on this side, and they only see BTK, but anybody that knew my family before his arrest would tell you like we were a normal family. You know, my dad wore his suit and his tie to church. You know, he was a good neighbor. He was a Boy Scout leader. What was this here? Um, so this is my yard and this was our driveway. You can see where the concrete was poured after 07 when it was um, bulldozed, the house was bulldozed. This was your front yard. Yeah, this was the driveway and there was uh, flowers here. There's like a photo of me little with flowers there. And your dad planted those oh, flowers? Oh, dad planted everything. That was my favorite climbing tree. It was right over the patio. So we had a porch swing and a, my dad had laid a brick patio. We had a porch swing there and it was landscaped. And so what about I, the tree house? What? The tree house was over in this corner um, into the back tree. It wasn't attached to the tree. It was on four big like telephone stilts that he got at Payless Lumber. And mom would be like, well, don't you want to go like shopping at the mall and buy a dress? I'm like, no mom. Really? I want to go fish with dad. I can't believe you used to climb this tree. Yeah. <laughs> you were a tomboy? Type? Oh, total, you like 100% still like tomboy, yeah. like, cause I was dad's kid. So, so he's the kind of dad who built you a tree house, right. uh, played with you in the tree house, had right. a good time with you, yeah. but yet he was the serial killer. That mur murdered um, Mrs. Hedge when I was six. Right down the road. Right down the road. Maureen Hedge was the one victim Carrie knew. The year was 1985. Recently widowed, Mrs. Hedge lived alone, just a few houses away. Carrie and her parents frequently walked by Mrs. Hedge's house and would greet her with a friendly hello. For some reason, it appears somebody between the early morning hours of Saturday, April 27th, and later that day, cut phone lines to Hedge's home, broke into the house, and kidnapped the 53-year-old Park City woman. I knew she was missing and it scared me, you know, that, that she was missing. And I'm sure my parents were talking about it too, mm -hmm. which is insane if you think about now. Right. And then about, I think it was about 10 days later, they had found her body. So somehow at six, I knew she had been strangled, like taken out in the country and they found her strangled. BTK had already established a pattern of claiming responsibility for his murders by leaving cryptic notes for police and the news media. As with all the others, Maureen Hedge was bound, tortured, and killed. But BTK did not admit to this killing at the time. He lived too close for comfort and didn't want investigators connecting his neighborhood with BTK. But upon his capture 20 years later, Raider shared the shocking details of his crime. Well, I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar. She screamed and jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. Eventually uh, moved her to the trunk of the car. <sighs> Took the car over to uh, Christ Lutheran Church. 
she was already dead, so I took uh, pictures of her in different forms of bondage. Your dad actually took your neighbor's body after he murdered her, took Maureen Hedge's body to Christ Lutheran, the right. church you grew up in, mm -hmm. and laid it on the floor and took pictures. And dressed, of he her. dressed her and up. And he dressed her up and in bondage. Yeah. In the church you grew up in? Yeah, so I didn't know. He told the police that, I believe, when he was arrested that night when he confessed. Yeah. But then it didn't come out publicly till he was in the plea in, in June. And so, like, my poor pastor was sitting there. My dad wasn't home the night Mrs. Hedge was missing. He was at a Boy Scout camp because yeah, he was camp, a Boy Scout leader. Tawakani out there by Andover. And, and come to find out, yeah, he was at a Boy Scout overnight. Right, but he but left. But he left the Boy Scout overnight. Right. Went and killed your neighbor, whom you had said hi to. Yeah. And, and then went back to the Boy Scout camp, after, spent the night. And, yeah, after taking her to the church and then um, dumping her body out in eastern Wichita. Meanwhile, Carrie says life continued to seem to go on as normal for the Raider family, her father going about his business as a security guard, and later a Park City compliance officer. This is video of him on the job in an old news story about city code enforcement. At the same time, Raider rose to become president of the congregation at Christ Lutheran Church. And if you ask him about it, he would say he just compartmentalized it. That's how he that's explains what they, it. That's what they say. Like, that they, he was able, like if he's with you, he's just your dad or he's BTK. Right. But anybody that's been with BTK isn't alive. What do you remember about this street? Good memories or bad memories? Um, I mainly have good memories from living here. I mean, this is the only place I ever lived. Um, so, I mean, I was always out with my dad, like gardening, helping plant flowers, you know, building the tree house, out here with my bike. What are your favorite memories of your father? Um, so I grew up really close to my dad. So probably some of my favorite memories are family, like family vacations. We, we would always usually take the car and drive all over. We were completely normal. Like I would have said I was living the American dream up until 05. Then in 2005, just as police closed in and arrested BTK, authorities were alerting each member of the Raider family at exactly the same time. Carrie was living in Michigan. An FBI agent showed up at her door. And then he says, like, have you heard of BTK? And your head just spins because you're like... And what did you first say to him when he said, <sighs> when you, when he said that to you? I was like, you mean the man that is one of her, like, strangling, you know, women or murder? I think I said murdering, like, murdering one of her murderers in Kansas, and he said yes. And then what did you say to him? Well, what did you ask as him? Well, as soon as he mentioned BTK, I thought maybe something had happened to my um, dad's mother, because I knew BTK in the past had murdered women that, like, lived alone. So, so I thought so I thought BTK had murdered my grandma. So you said to the FBI, Yeah, I said, is my grandma Dorothea okay? And he's like, yeah, she's fine. And then he says, your dad's BTK, you know, and I'm going in physical shock. I'm starting to shake. Um, I'm like, the room's spinning. Like, it got really bright and like, I'm trying to keep it together and I'm already going in a like, physical shock, like mental and physical shock. So he has to keep trying to say, your dad is BTK. He just keeps repeating it because he's trying to get, because there's nothing computing, like no one's home. So I'm like holding on to the kitchen wall and I'm like, I'm going to fall down because I thought I was going to faint. And so he said, you know, I'm like, I need to sit down. So I'm walking across the living room and I sit down on the couch. And then I'm like, I need to call my husband because, and I'm, I think the FBI agent realized right away, like, we had no idea. So did you say to your mom, this this can't be dad? Yeah, I mean, we were basically echoing back and forth. They got the wrong guy. But as Carrie learned more, reality sunk in. Raider may have never been caught had he not decided to resurface in 2004, 13 years after torturing and killing his last victim, Dolores Davis. So you had never heard of the BTK acronym no. until 2004? No. You, you had never heard of it as a child or? No, I had no idea. 
I was like, what? I was like, that's crazy that that had happened in my hometown. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, like we never talked about it or anything in our house. Isn't that weird? You never talked about it in your house? No. But BTK was once again front page after he sent a letter and souvenirs, as he called them, to the Wichita Eagle. He was bragging about the murder of Vicki Weggerly in September of 1986. Carrie recalls just two months earlier, her father had packed up the family and taken them all to Disneyland. You can match up the timeline of like the last three murders when I was alive. I went to Disneyland in 86 and then a month later he murdered Mrs. Weggerly. Right. So like you can't really separate that out now. Then the killer started leading authorities on scavenger hunts across the city of Wichita, leaving serial killer boxes filled with dolls posed as victims and jewelry from some of the women he had killed. BTK resurfaced in March of 2004. In May of 2004, your whole family came to Michigan to visit you. Yeah. And did you notice anything different? <laughs> no, same guy. And then Christmas of 2004, yeah. two months before your dad right. was arrested, y'all yeah. came home for Christmas, stayed yeah. at your parents' house. Did you notice anything then? Was it a normal Christmas or? Um, Everything was pretty normal, except I noticed he was, he seemed to have been, he looked older, like worn down, mm -hmm. like he had aged between like May and December, but he seemed, he seemed like he was kind of sad. And I, I thought, well, maybe he's sad because I, like his kids are home and we're never home anymore, you know, and he was just emotional having us there. Maybe he knew that he wasn't going to be with you much um, longer, or? Yeah, I mean, on, in hindsight, I would assume he would, he would have realized like, I would have hoped he would have realized that, mm -hmm. but like, obviously he, he didn't want to turn himself in. So you said goodbye to him at Christmas. Y yeah, like- It was a normal goodbye, never knowing you would never see him again. Just a few weeks later, BTK's game of cat and mouse finally did him in. He sent a message on a computer disc to the Wichita Fox TV station. With special forensic software, police were able to extract concealed user data from the one file on the disc. They discovered that at one time, the original title of that file was Christ Lutheran Church, and the person last using it was someone logged into a computer under the name Dennis. But investigators still needed proof positive that church president Dennis Rader was BTK. They got it from his daughter. So I was online and CNN all of a sudden is saying like local Wichita news are reporting that Carrie turned in her father and gave a blood sample. So I was like, what? I knew I hadn't turned in my dad and I knew I hadn't given blood. A couple weeks later, it came out in the news that the um, Wichita police and KBI had gone, once they thought they knew my dad, which was pretty sure it was my dad, they got a warrant for my medical records at K-State. Carrie had graduated from K-State and while there had tests at health services both a pap smear and a biopsy. Investigators traveled to Manhattan with a subpoena in hand for those smears. Her DNA, a direct match to DNA left at BTK crime scenes. I'm not learning this from the people that did it and I'm not learning it privately. I'm learning it from CNN. How did you feel about it? Really violated and really just mainly violated and embarrassed that now like the national news is talking about like the most private female test. You talked to your father and mother hours before your dad was arrested the night before. Yeah, I, we were just having a like once a week check in phone call. It was usually was with my mom, but I did talk to my dad. What, what did he say the night before just he normal. was arrested? Just like any dad, like how's the car running, you know, and like, like you're still, you're only like 26, so you're still kind of new to being an adult. So you would ask things like, how often do I need to change the oil or when should I change the tires? And those are good dad questions. Those aren't mom questions. That moment, life changed forever. Her father was caught and she never talked to him again. She did, however, write to him. Why did you write to him? Because he, 
he was my dad and I loved him and he needed to know, you know, he needed to know that I, that we still cared about him, but he also needed to know the ramifications of what he had done and how much suffering it was causing. And some of it we just needed to communicate because he needed to know early on, he needed to know that we were safe and okay and we needed him to plead guilty. So we had you been, asked him to plead guilty. Yes, in your we had been encouraged by several people quietly to try to get him to, you know, do the right thing and confess and not put all the families and our family in the city through a massive trial. So we do you think that's why he pled guilty? Because I think you we asked helped. him to. I mean, it was his decision. You know, like he's hard headed and does what he wants to do anyway. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea how I was going to convince him to plead guilty because now he had, like, the narcissistic BTK side had the spotlight on him finally. After first pleading not guilty, Raider reversed course. He admitted in court to murdering each of his 10 victims, shocking the world in a detailed, matter-of-fact confession broadcast on live TV. I broke into the house and waited for her to come home. The strangulation wasn't working on her, and I uh, used a knife on her. So at the hearing where right. he went into excruciating detail about every single murder, did you watch that? Um, my best recollection is that I watched a little online. I stabbed her, and she said he stabbed two or three times, uh, either here or here. So what did you think of that? Your father going into this detail about every single murder and almost delighting in the detail. Pretty much, it's like pretty much almost the death of you. Talked with her a little bit, and calmed her down a little bit, uh, strangled her. What did you strangle her with? Pantyhose. Rader explained he was playing out sexual fantasies through these ruthless killings. Nancy Fox was another one of the projects. Uh, broke in and waited for her to come home in the kitchen. I uh, confronted her, uh, told her that I was a, uh, had a problem, sexual problem, that I would have to tie her up and have sex with her. Now at this point, as his daughter is writing to him, Dennis Rader was waiting to appear in court. But he called me at home on July 2nd, 2005. He was incarcerated at the Sedgwick County Detention Facility downtown. It was a Saturday morning, and it was a call I never expected to receive. I had sent Rader several letters, hoping at some point there would be an interview possibility. Now, I received three letters from him. In one of the letters I had given him my phone number, on the off chance that he might call. Well, he did. The jail phone call quality was awful. Buzzes and hisses dominated the line, but... We talked, and it is the only news interview that exists with the man called BTK. Uh, I called back to me, I bring it up. I just know it's the dark side of me, it kind of controls me. That's what he says caused him to do the killings. Now, he could never really explain it, but he said that he was very compartmentalized. I can live a normal life and quickly switch from one gear to the next. I guess that's why I survived so well. And I'll tell you what struck me. I was amazed at how normal he sounded. Mm -hmm. He sounded like the guy next door. Mm -hmm. We could have been talking about flowers or gardening or working on the car, whatever. And I was stunned by that because when you say the word BTK, mm -hmm. you really think of a monster. Yeah. You think of him as dad. Yeah. When you hear that a, he's talking to me, a reporter, in a normal conversation, that doesn't surprise you. It doesn't because he would have considered you as somebody he knew even though he had never met you because like me, he would have watched you on the news, you know, and obviously had been watching you a lot more carefully probably in 04 when he was, had gone public. So like he would actually have like called you Larry in our house or called you Susan. Now as I talk to him, for most of society, the thought of killing a child is unthinkable. But for Dennis Rader, the children were just collateral damage. That's a very hard question. Uh, I, 
think in the long run it was a sexual fantasy. They, they, if you really look at it, they were more of the more of the object action of going toward the crime. There was some probably some sexual fantasy in that. But uh, more more of it was tended towards the adult person. The uh, kids just happened to be there, I think. It's probably the only one that uh, I heard about your interview in 05, and like, I knew my dad was kind of full of crap. Like, I mean, he had already confessed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's, I think what he's trying to say is that there's something in him that drives him to, to commit murder mm -hmm. and, and the like sexual sadistic stuff he does. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he, I don't think he knows what that is, and I don't think he has a word for it. So I think he was trying to tell you that was within him mm -hmm. or with him when he was doing those things. Mm -hmm. Like later on, what he's called it his X factor. Exactly. So like, but I think it's also his way of trying to swindle out of being culpable mm -hmm. and, and saying, well, this thing drove me in me and I, you know, I want to give it a name or I want to draw it, you know, but like that thing is psychopathy, mm -hmm. you know, or that ability to be immoral and disconnect in the way we're moral mm -hmm. and we have that stop gap he doesn't have. Right. So then the question is, was he born without the stop gap? Was he born a psychopath? Did he become one? What caused him to become one? And like the only person that has that answers is my dad. He said he does not know what caused him to make that left turn. Do you have any idea? I mean, if you look at like more recent interviews, like in Catherine Ramsland's book, that came out in 16, mm -hmm. like you can tell my dad had what we would now call a conduct disorder. But like in the 40s, I mean, nobody was doing therapy. Nobody was helping kids mm -hmm. in that way. So my like where now we would see that in a child, maybe if he was causing like animal abuse or he's like my dad has said, like he was like spying in women's windows and, mm -hmm. you know, taking panties and things again. That's all coming from my dad, so there's nobody to back that up. So we don't even know if that's reliable because you can't right. necessarily rely on anything my dad says. Mm -hmm. So if he was, say, sexually abused when he was little, my question is who did it? That anybody that would have done it would be dead. Mm -hmm. So the only person that still holds the answers is my dad. He's not reliable as a narrator, and he's not going to tell you. For me, the chilling part of my audio interview with Dennis Rader, he said, he wasn't done killing when he was caught. Yes and no. It was probably, there was probably one more. Uh, I was really thinking about it that I was being mislocated on my age wise, my thinking process. And that to do it probably never win. It was more of a, uh, probably more of an ego thing. Had you, had you picked the person that? Oh, yes, and I'm, yeah. there, was, there, was, there was one more we picked out. Now, police knew who it was following his capture. She was told. And can you imagine how chilling that would have been to know that you were one of his intended victims? Now, many assumed Raider was trying to be caught, that he was ready to give up on killing. Well, he disputed that. No, I was not planning on being caught. I just uh, played cat and mouse too long with the police, and they finally figured it out. No, no I was going to write off the sunset. I was closing everything down. I had about another, about another half a year. If he were sitting here, what would you tell him and would you give him a hug? Yeah, I mean, I would still feel safe with him because I told, like, I still remember how I felt to hug him last time and I would like to think that I would just be talking to my dad and hugging my dad, but I might go screaming out the door. In sharing correspondence with Dennis Rader, I was shocked when he basically asked, if he could be on Hatterberg's people. Well, I wrote him back telling him that the killing of 10 people profoundly negated any aspect of that ever happening. And I was really stunned at how he would even think that that would be a possibility. Now, he would write odd things, both in the letters and on the envelopes. Now, one of the envelopes, there was a picture of a lighthouse. Another letter contained a drawing of Raider's radar, whatever that meant. Then the attached poem that he had written that he had titled Shared Times. Now he wrote, we have shared correspondence, thoughts, and abundance. 
Now the time has come that we must part because the wheels came off before the cart. That was by Dennis Rader and he signed it, AKA The Suspect. Now everything about this story is strange, terrible, and sad. But if you are Dennis Rader's daughter, all of these things aren't just a story in a newspaper or on TV. This is her daily life. Do you think this story for you will ever end? I, I can't, I mean, aspects of it obviously get better. You know, I mean, like the media let up after 05, you know, and then came back in 14 and then they let up. So aspects of it get better and I've learned how to work with the media. You know, I've learned how to talk about it, how to look people in the eye. You know, like Darian would say after 05, I was shut down, I wouldn't look you in the eye. You know, I like I didn't have that strength or that belief in myself, confidence that I could look somebody in the eye. So that's better. I mean, I can sit here, I can talk about it openly. So in many ways, I'm, I'm healed in those ways, but I don't think I'll ever be fully healed and I don't think the story will ever be over. I mean, maybe uh, like in a few more generations after all of us have passed, but you, you're still seeing the ramifications because my kids only have one grandfather and they know their grandfather's in jail and at some point we're gonna have to tell them why he's in jail. So now my kids are growing up with only one grandfather. Now they're growing up with a mom that's got PTSD and depression that's, you know, tries to manage it the best she can, but that still gets in your home. Just before Raider was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms, victims' loved ones got a chance to speak their peace. Dennis Rader killed my wife in uh, 1986. He caused me to challenge my faith, change my future forever. This monster took her life. My mother begged for her life, yet he showed no remorse. I'd just like for him to suffer for the rest of his life. As far as I'm concerned, Dennis Rader does not deserve to live. After the sentencing, you know, I realized the enormity of what my father had done, and I didn't watch the victim impact statements at the sentencing. I have yet to read them. Like, in the last few years, I tried to go read the court transcripts, and I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Because, like, there's graphic details about how he injured, like, the women, you know, and I, I just couldn't do it. What about the victims' families? <sighs> I mean, I've never contacted them and they've never contacted me. We've always kept, you know, kept polite distance. And what would you say to them? I mean, I, th I think it would be really immensely difficult. I, kept, I keep getting asked, like, don't you want to sit down with them? And I'm like, I would be sobbing, but I just don't think I could do it. Like I, because I'm the daughter of the man that killed their daughter and their sisters and their wives and their mothers. What would you say to them? Do you know? I mean, I realized the enormity of what my father had done and then it hit me like that if my father had been arrested after the Otero murders, which he should have been, you know, then my brother and I wouldn't be alive, but six other people would be. Do you want to say anything to the victims' families who may be watching this? Um, just that, like, if I could do anything, I would just take all of it and not have any of it have happened, you know, go back in time and just remove all of it, you know, and then that way I would just have my dad and they would have their families and none of us would have had to been put through what we put through, like, you know, decades of hell for them and just have our normal lives. My father made a choice every time he stepped into somebody's home, every time he did what he did, he made that choice. He had full control of it and he did it anyway. You know, like, I, I can't, I don't understand that. I don't think anybody can really ever understand that. I mean, you know, you see all the criminology books and everyone trying to make sense of it, and it, there's just no rational way to make sense of it, that somebody, somebody can choose to do that and then just be normal again. So the question keeps coming up over and over and over again, and 14, 15, 20 years later, it will still come up. How did you and your brother and your mother 
not have a clue that your father was BTK? Because I hate that question. I get it all the time still from strangers. It makes me mad. You've lived with this man every day of your life, you know, up till you're 18 and then off and on till you're 26, okay? He's normally always just your dad. You know, occasionally he had a temper. A couple of times he was abusive. You know, he was just a temperamental man. I figured- But you don't go from that to- There's no way you would go from that to thinking he was a, a murderer. There's, there's nothing to connect those two. Any suggestion that this devoted family man, Boy Scout leader and church leader could be a serial killer would have seemed patently absurd to everyone but the killer himself. For 30 years, the identity of BTK remained a mystery. Then on February 26, 2005, the announcement came. Shortly after noon, yesterday afternoon, agents from the KBI, agents from the FBI, and members of the Wichita Police Department arrested Dennis Rader. Though their detective work turned her life upside down, Carrie has this to say about the two key investigators who brought her father to justice, Detective Kelly Otis and the late Lieutenant Ken Landwehr. So I was really mad at the police, but then when I got to meet him and I noticed like how genuinely caring like Kenny was and, you know, Otis, like they actually cared and they were protective. And, they, and they're standing there in your living room telling you like, we knew you were innocent right away. You know, we've tried to protect you. We've tried to keep the media away. We've tried to like, keep you safe. And you realize these people are heroes and have had your back, you know, and they're heroes because they caught your dad and kept your mom safe, kept your family safe, kept the community safe, prevented any other murders. You know, you just sort of want to like hug these guys. I never got to talk to Kenny again. So then in January 14, I was reading the Eagle online and I saw that he had passed away from cancer and I was just bawling. I was just sitting there on my computer bawling because like, here, Kenny wasn't even very old, and now he's gone, and my dad gets to live. You know, it was so unfair, like, to lose Kenny. Would you have rather Ken live oh, and, yeah. and your father yeah. Yeah. didn't? I really? mean, as much as I love my dad, like, it's not fair. Like, you know, like, it's not fair at all, like, that the good people die, you know, or, like, everything the families have been through and what they still go through like how much suffering he's caused through hundreds of people, if not thousands, and what he's like put the city through and the media through. And I mean, we're all just people that had to live this, you know, and then he just gets to be alive. After her dad was arrested, investigators combed through Raider's home. They found items from the victims hidden away that BTK had kept for decades as mementos of his crimes. And so this is where he, underneath these floorboards right here is where he kept some of the souvenirs. Yeah, he kept like a uh, driver's license and jewelry from what we understand. And then he had built a false bottom underneath the wooden floor. The day of her father's arrest, Carrie's mother moved out and no one ever lived in the house again. The city of Park City eventually bought it and tore it down to keep gawkers away. Now there's just this vacant lot. What does it feel like being here? I mean, really, if I get back here, I can just, I just see my childhood. You know, I don't really, I see dad back here. You do? Right, because. You see your dad back here? Yeah, I, and just growing up, I can picture myself in the hammock with my mom and, you know, up the tree. I can see myself up the tree reading and, you know, cookouts out here with family and my grandparents. And so back here's where I garden with my dad. We had, he had a huge garden back here, and that's my sled back there. For some reason, it's still there when I was a kid. That's yeah, your was, sled? Yeah, I was shocked when I saw it. Whoa. Your sled is still back here. Yeah. There's a shovel back there, too. I'm pretty sure that's my dad's shovel back there. So I don't know why nobody your got that Your dad's shovel is here. Yeah. It was just missed when they cleaned everything else out and nobody's come to get it. But I, my guess is after I say that, um, <laughs> someone gonna, will come and get it. Someone's going to come get it. Uh, 
how's your mother doing? I mean, considering everything she's been through, she's doing okay. Like she's really mentally and emotionally strong, stronger than we had thought. So she lost her husband. And then she was told every day of her life had been a lie with him, you know, back to 1970. And then now she's lost her house. Now she's got the media stalking her. Now she's, you know, lost her income. So yes, my dad, like my dad had victimized her, you know, but now here she's lost everything. Does she still communicate with her father? No, she hasn't wrote him since 05. He still since writes her. And she's never written him back? She hasn't wrote him back since 05. And what about you? Um, yeah, so there were long blocks where we didn't write, and then since 12, I've stayed in touch, you know, three or four times a year. Carrie says living in Michigan with her husband and two children has allowed her some privacy and distance between her and her father's terrible crimes. But she has come out of the shadows with her book, A Serial Killer's Daughter. It's been like a cathartic process of having to go do really hard work and find those memories again of my father that I had lost and to try to separate my dad back out as my dad and remove the BTK from it. Carrie says her brother has visited their dad in prison, but she never has. Their only communication has been through letters, some of which she has shared in her book. And in 12, I forgave him. I wrestled with it for long, for months before I forgave him. And I wanted him to know right away I had forgiven him. Mm -hmm. And when I forgave him, it sort of released a lot of that anger and what was shut down in me kind of just pulled it out. So it wasn't even so much as forgiving him for what he had done to me. It was more just kind of almost forgiving myself for just kind of letting it go. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote him right away to tell him, you know, that I forgave him and like, if he had asked God for forgiveness, then I would see him in heaven, and I believe that. And I wanted him to know that and tell him I loved him. And since then, you know, I've been more able to communicate with him, and my husband said I've been more like myself. He just has very matter-of-fact statements in his letters. Right, I mean, early on, like, you don't ever see any remorse, really, just more remorse that he got caught, you know, or remorse. Have you ever seen any remorse in his letters? There's one in September where he writes a line where after the sentencing he said he's so sorry for the victims and he asked God to be between him and the victims. Do you believe him? I think in those moments I want to believe him, but I've also been told like he could just be trying to like throw the faith element at you knowing it's important. In the book, Carrie describes the hell that often consumed her life ever since learning that her father is BTK. You still have night terrors. Oh yeah, like about crime scenes? Yeah, about... I didn't last night at the hotel, but I've had them this week. Like like at home this week, I, I screamed and then I thought somebody was after me and I shut myself in my bathroom. Like that's how bad it is. Wow. So that it's, it's always, almost always somebody trying to like attack or kill me. And then people come at me still today and say you're not a victim and you haven't suffered and you don't have the right to sit here and talk about it. I'm like, walk in my shoes for a second and see if you would still even be alive now. I mean, I'm sure there were times when you were suicidal. Oh yeah, I mean, it's still can kind of come and go. It's just sort of, you just sort of live with it. I mean, it still comes and goes. Like when I was writing the book, the PTSD got so bad, I had to ask for 10 months of extensions. Like, you know, I'm having to call my editor and my agent. I'm bawling on the phone because I'm such a mess. When you take all of that, all of what my dad did, you know, you take like 30 years and you put it in a box and you go, oh, I'm fine. You know, and you walk around and you tell the world I'm fine. After a while, you're not fine because it tears you up from inside. You're not. And you're not fine because you're not actually dealing with it. So you think of your dad as someone who hurt you? Um, I mean, obviously the most, the worst of the pain came after the arrest, obviously, you know, like the shock and the grief and trying to cope with the fact that you never knew this man and what he, what he had done. I lost myself. My, I lost myself when my dad was arrested. I was being told and the national media pounded 
as BTK's daughter. We want an interview with BTK's daughter. You look at all the headlines even today. If you were if you were to Google me, it's BTK's daughter. It's not Carrie Rawson. My book is called A Serial Killer's Daughter. Like I pushed back against that title, but they were like, "That's what you are." It took, you know, more than a decade to be able to say, "I'm BTK's daughter. I'm a serial killer's daughter. This is my reality." Now, how do I live and how do I function? What do I do with that for good? You know, I've learned how to talk about it, how to look people in the eye. So that's better. I mean, I can sit here, I can talk about it openly. So in many ways, I'm, I'm healed in those ways, but I don't think I'll ever be fully healed and I don't think the story will ever be over. You have two kids and a wonderful husband leading a the best possible life you can in Michigan? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we have all the regular struggles everyone else has, you know, trying to make ends meet and keep the cars running and get the kids to school. Day to day, day to day, I'm a mom and, you know, a wife. And so day to day, I'm just Carrie, you know, but Google me, I'm not, you know, I'm BTK's daughter. So somewhere in there is, is me now, you know trying to lead a very normal, wonderful life. Yeah, I'm trying to lead a good life and leave a good life for my kids and take raise them right. I mean, my dad ra raised me right, he just didn't. For people to understand, like, they don't need to vilify my family and hate us and mock us. You know, they don't need to be on social media doing what they do. You know, that I'm a real person and I live this every day. I don't, I walk away from here and I don't get to turn it off. Dennis Rader is serving his 10 life sentences at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. He's locked up in solitary confinement for his own protection, but is allowed to watch television, listen to the radio and read magazines if he is on good behavior. Though she has never visited her father there, Carrie says prison visitors can talk to him only over closed circuit television. She says she has no plans to ever do that. For Susan Peters, I'm Larry Hatterberg. Thanks for watching. The Law Offices of Morris Lang in Wichita supports KPTS. With attorneys practicing in over 35 areas of law, including bankruptcy, personal injury, and family law. On the web at morrislang.com. Funding for this program is made possible in part by an anonymous KPTS donor. Hotel accommodations provided by La Quinta Inn and Suites, Wichita Airport. Proudly supporting this program on KPTS Channel 8.